Nice to see you all. Welcome back. Uh, and welcome to those of you who are joining us uh, from uh, other uh, institutions. It's great to have you uh, here at, at Roger Williams. Um, and you're going to learn uh, a lot today, I hope, about um, uh, what it's like to be a student here. But of course, uh, your best uh, resource are the people who are um, sitting uh, among you. But I want you to know that uh, we're really uh, excited to, uh, to have you here. Um, we're very excited as well uh, to have the, uh, t our 2Ls and uh, 3Ls here. Uh, thank you for, for coming. I think this was mandatory, so, but I'll thank you anyway. Um, but uh, I, we, we've got a lot of great events planned uh, for the semester. You will uh, be hearing about them uh, via email and other uh, means of communication as the semester goes on. I don't want to take up a lot of time uh, or take up any more time uh, on that. Um, but I, I do think what's important to think about as you're thinking about uh, what, you're, um, uh, what you're about to hear is that um, in your second year and in your third year, uh, the world is going to open up uh, for you, uh, fortunately, I think, um, particularly for those of you who are uh, 2Ls. While there is still a lot of, um, you know, traditional uh, classroom doctrinal work going on, uh, this is uh, your opportunity uh, to uh, start to get out into the world uh, and to uh, develop the skills that you're going to need um, to practice uh, when you leave here and uh, perhaps to uh, reconnect uh, with the uh, passion that brought you to law school, uh, get you into placements where you're doing the kind of work um, that brought you here or the kind of work that you've started to get excited about uh, since you came here. Um, and thinking about preparing to leave for those of you who are uh, three L's. Uh, so there'll be uh, some of that uh, today too. I just wanna um, make three quick uh, announcements. Um, uh, for those of you who haven't been uh, to a class yet in, at One Empire, uh, we have a terrific new building uh, in Providence. Uh, the clinic classes uh, will be held there. The externship classes will be held there. Uh, there are a lot of uh, after hours, adjunct taught classes uh, that will be held there. Uh, and we will have at least one class um, in each of the next two semesters um, that's a more, uh, that is a traditional doctrinal class uh, where there will be students uh, both in Providence uh, and in Bristol. Uh, and the, uh, the course will be uh, simulcast, for lack of a better word, uh, between the two uh, buildings. So for those of you who are spending time in Providence, uh, we're trying to come up with a way uh, to um, make it easier for you to take the courses that you want without necessarily having to come back uh, to Bristol. Um, announcement number two is that, um, and I'm really sad to say this, but um, Linda Vieira uh, is going to be leaving us to take an, another position uh, at the university. It's a really terrific promotion for her. Um, and uh, but we're going to miss her a lot. Uh, she will be working uh, here uh, during the transition period uh, in, in student services until we find her replacement. Um, but we are uh, already, we have already started that search and it, we'll try to have somebody great uh, in place as, as soon as possible. So if you, if you don't see Linda physically here, it means she's over at the university, uh, but she will be uh, she will be here sometimes, and she will be helping from uh, uh, from over at over on the other side. Um, and then I just want to remind you that at 4:30 tomorrow, uh, we're going to gather on the Commons Quad right outside the uh, Lower Commons uh, uh, or the the Commons Building uh, for a peace vigil. There are few, um, if any, uh, undergraduate students on campus, but the university community um, has been invited. But th this is an, an event uh, that's um, intended to be uh, primarily for uh, the law school and, and law students. But we will be joined by some folks from the university. So I hope to see uh, uh, many of you there. Um, 
with that, uh, on to uh, some business. And who do you associate more with business than the so No, not that kind. Yeah, Santoro, that's true. Fair enough, fair enough. Yeah, that is a very good answer. Well, who, who was that? Extra credit. You get extra credit. Uh, but the, the, the business-like, but friendly, Associate Dean Hassel. Hi, everybody. I just have a few things to remind you. Of course, I am Diana Hassel, the Associate Dean. I know I'm teaching some of you in constitutional law. If for some reason we've avoided each other up till now, that's probably good. Um, but um, I'm down in the Dean suite, so if, if any problems come up with respect to your schedule or academic issues, uh, I'm your contact person. I just wanted to remind you, again, I know you've been reminded of this many times, but especially for the three L's, in a few short months, I'm going to be certifying you to uh, take a bar examination. And one of the things I have to say is that you are of sufficient character and fitness to be a member of a bar of Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Nevada, wherever you want to go. So review the character and fitness questions in the application. Think about, is there anything you should have told us that you didn't? Uh, it is always, almost always the case that the cover up is worse than the crime. So if you did something and fought, didn't tell us when you applied here, or if something has happened of a, a criminal nature or a civil liability nature or an employment problem while you've been here, you should make an appointment to come talk to me so we have everything set up and ready to go so I can give an explanation to the bar examiners for wh whatever it is that went on. So just keep that in mind. Now's the time to think back over since the application, has there been anything that you think might might be relevant, uh, any criminal matter, any, um, as I said, any being sued by someone, being dismissed from a job. These are things you should probably come talk to me about. Um, the other thing I wanted to, on another grim note, I just wanted to say uh, the honor code. It's at the back of the of their student handbook, which is in these little booklets here. It's also available online. The uh, student chair this year is Andrew Dimitri. If you have any questions about what, um, you know, what, you, what your obligations are uh, after reading the code, if you still have questions, you can talk to Andrew, you can talk to me. And of course, if you have any, uh, have, have, are, are, have knowledge of an honor code violation, you should come and talk to one of us and we can talk you through how to file an honor code uh, complaint. Uh, the last thing I wanted to mention is, again, take a look at your graduation requirements in Section 703 of the Academic Code. You don't want to be caught flat-footed and say, whoops, I never took Civil Procedure II. You know, so you want to make sure you've got all this done so you don't have to scramble your third year. And so that includes the required classes, your experiential skills classes, your pro bono hours, your writing requirement. It's all written down there. Just do a double check for yourself so you have time to get in whatever you need to have done. Um, the spring schedule will be, a draft will be distributed this week to you so you can take a look at it and figure out what you can plan for in the spring. The actual registration won't be happening till late October, so you'll have some time to uh, line it up and think of uh, uh, how you might want to arrange your spring um, schedule. And of course, if you have any questions or concerns about the schedule for either the spring or for next year, uh, please come talk to me. All right, I think that's it. Now on to Andy Horowitz. <clears throat> Hello, everybody. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Andy Horwitz. I'm the Assistant Dean for Experiential Education, and my job is to do uh, a little bit of talking and really very little about the experiential education component of our curriculum. In other words, the four credit uh, parts of our program that are about experiential learning. So um, much more to be said than can be said in a couple of minutes. Um, but suffice it to say, we have, and you should be aware, three in-house clinics, a field clinic, and seven, at this point, clinical externship programs. So a whole broad swath of opportunities available to you, and we strongly encourage students to take full advantage of these opportunities. They can come in multiple combinations. There are two handouts that I'm going to leave 
by the exit, that, but it's also all on the website in very clear format that talk to you about the various combinations of experiences you can have. You can have multiple clinic opportunities. You can have a, a clinic and a clinical externship. You can have two clinical externships. You can do a clinical externship that is what we call a semester in practice, so that your entire course load for that semester uh, is a, a clinical externship, and that can be done here, and it can be done outside of Rhode Island, and you participate remotely in the seminar component a class that goes along with that experience. Lots to describe, I can't try and describe it now. What I can describe is the planning process involved. So every semester, we hold an information session for students to come and learn much more specifically about all the different clinics and externships. And then there's an application period. So this is separate and apart from the registration period for classes. Again, this is all on the website, but just to sort of draw your attention to it. Um, this semester, we're holding an information session on September 28th, and then the applications for the spring semester clinics and clinical externships will be due on October 5th. We have, as I think you probably all know, what we call a clinical guarantee. So this is now speaking to the second year students. If you apply in our application period in the spring of your second year, you will be guaranteed a placement in some clinical education component, a clinic or a clinical externship. Not necessarily the top choice, not necessarily the semester you want, but we actually have been able to do a very good job at, at managing people's priorities and preferences and getting people the experiences they want so long as they apply in a timely fashion. So for the second year students who are looking to do something in their third year, the spring application period covers both the fall and spring semester of your third year. The application period that I described at the beginning that uh, applications due this October, October 5th, will be for the spring semester of this year. So second year students can certainly apply for those experiences. In particular, the judicial externship, which is sort of fertile ground for second year, second semester students. Uh, and third year students, if you didn't apply in the prior semester, you've sort of passed the window of the guarantee, but that doesn't mean that we won't do anything and everything we can to make sure that if you want a clinical experience that you will get one before you graduate. Um, so what I would do is urge you to check out and read the information on the website, pick up the handouts if you're somebody who prefers to have it in hard copy rather than on the website, but uh, remember the information session on September 28th and please come, even if you don't think you're going to apply in this cycle, you can learn about the experiences and do a better job of planning uh, ahead. So that's the academic credit part of our experiential education program here. But there are other pieces. Actually, it's not all of it, because the next piece that I'm going to leave to Reed Porter to describe also has an academic cr uh, credit component for those who want it. So, Reed. Hi, everyone. I'm Reed Porter. I'm with the Marine Affairs Institute. Um, I came on in March, so some of you I have met already. For some of you, I'm, I'm, I'm new. So um, you can find me in the Marine Affairs Institute office, which is in the back corner of the second floor here. Um, I run the Sea Grant Law Fellow Program, which as 2Ls and 3Ls, you are all eligible for. Um, this is a little bit different type of a, 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 an experiential education um, opportunity. Um, on, in this program, you work um, under my guidance on a project for an outside organization. Um, that organization can be government, can be um, a corporation or a nonprofit organization. Um, it's on any topics that may be related to um, uh, marine law. Uh, whether that's maritime or sort of natural resources topics. Um, I come up with the projects and the partnerships, so um, you don't have to come up with anything. Um, it's a little bit different also because it's done on your own time. Um, it's not a, a specific course time, um, and it's either offered as a paid or a for credit opportunity. Um, now, today is the end of the ad drop period, so the, the window for credit um, is almost very much closed. Um, so if you are interested in this program and you want to do it for credit, you must come to see me ASAP, like right after this. Um, 
orientation. Um, if you want to uh, apply for pay, the, the deadline is today. Um, I sent out a couple of emails about this um, uh, last week and this week. Uh, if you need more time but you're interested, please come and see me or contact me by email. Um, so the, the, just a, a couple of example projects for you that we have this semester, and, and they change every semester, but um, this semester we have uh, projects looking at um, the regulatory environment for aquaculture, uh, shellfish aquaculture siting and permitting in, in Massachusetts, and that'll cover everything from shipping channels to um, water quality standards. Um, we have work on marine debris that's uh, related to navigation safety um, and derelict fishing gear, um, also recycling of fiberglass, fiberglass vessels. Um, we have some work on wildlife crime um, related to ornamental fish importation, um, which is a very exciting partnership with the New England Aquarium. And um, some uh, work on coastal resiliency is this post-superstorm Sandy work with that we've been doing with the with the towns in Rhode Island um, to help them understand legal issues related to um, improving uh, resiliency against sea level rise and storms. Um, so if you're interested in any of those, um, put in an application. Come see me ASAP. Great. Okay, I'm next, I'm Lori Barron. I direct the Feinstein Center for Pro Bono and Experiential Education. And before I switch it, I'm really here to talk about the Pro Bono Experiential Learning Requirement or the PBELR. But before I get into that, I wanted to say, um, you should all come to the info session that Andy described about clinics and externships. I also teach the public interest externship and do a lot of placement of students who wanna go away for, for a semester in practice in another state. It's never too early to start planning that. And I already have some appointments with 2Ls who know they want to go away next spring, the spring of 2018. So feel free to make an appointment with me. My office also will help you sort of make sense of all the experiential education opportunities. And we love to meet with 2Ls and 3Ls to sort of help you plan your life. So you are welcome to stop by, um, come see us. And that's what, that's what we do, we're here. Um, so the first rule of the pro bono experiential learning requirement is do not leave the PBELR until the spring of your third year, okay? I know a lot of you have already completed it. How many of you have already got your pro bono hours? That's excellent. Okay, keep going because you can do more. And we recognize every student at graduation who's done 100 hours or more. So if you've already completed your 50, you should get a tracking sheet from us and keep track, okay? For those of you who haven't done it yet, um, I'm just going to go over quickly. There's a handout over there that basically says everything you need to know. But if you have a day or a day and a half in your schedule or a few half days, you can do your pro bono work right now during the semester with any one of our 45 pre-approved organizations. Okay, it's like a traditional internship. You apply and then, and then you, you are good to go, okay? If your schedule is really tight and you only have a couple hours a week or a couple of hours a month and you don't mind spreading your hours out over a couple of semesters, you should think about joining a pro bono collaborative project. Okay, these are projects where we partner law firms with law students and community-based organizations to work on discrete legal issues. Liza and Susie, Liza uh, Vorenberg and Susie Harrington Steppen will be tabling outside the bistro um, on September 1st. And you also received an email yesterday with a lot of opportunities for you. So take a peek at that. Um, and lastly, if it's easiest or most beneficial for you to do your pro bono in a short period of time, um, alternative spring break is a great way to do that. And the information session for ASB is October 5th. Um, so you guys should come to that. If you've already done ASB, you can do it again, okay? We've already started planning and meeting for ASB to plan for it. Once you figure out what you wanna do, you need to complete mandatory forms, which are all on our website. And you can just stop by our office and speak to Lisa Quinn or look at the website. Um, if you had a summer internship that you think might qualify for the PBELR, it's not too late to submit your paperwork. You should email Susie Harrington Steppen. It may qualify and you may have already completed it. Um, again, the first rule of the PBELR is don't wait until the third semester, the, the, the second semester of your third year. If you are taking the bar in New York, the New York pro bono rule is not identical to our rule. So you need to read that rule carefully. We have information on it about the website, but don't assume that by completing our pro bono hours, you're qualified for New York. 
Um, and lastly, for the 100 hour recognition for the graduating 3Ls this year, watch for an email in the next couple of weeks telling you how to apply to us to make sure that we recognize you at graduation. Thanks. Welcome back. I can't tell you how happy we are to see you back in the building. And I want to give you a few updates first on the Office of Career Development. So both Tiffany and Jody are back in the office. They were out, as you may recall, uh, this spring having babies. But uh, they are back now and very happy and have lots of pictures. So come on by and say hello. And we also have a new program coordinator in the office. Her name is Trish Milan. She's here in the, in the auditorium here uh, in the corner. So she is here to help you set up an appointment with our office, to answer any questions you have, assisting with programming, anything uh, that you may need. Feel free to come in and say hello to Trish and welcome her to the school. So what I want to give you, uh, an overview of today is what you should be doing right now with respect to your resumes, with respect to your job searches and the like. So if you have just rolled off of an internship or uh, in, uh, working as a law clerk at an organization, make sure you update your resume now. Don't wait for a deadline. Uh, deadlines will be coming up for clinics and externships for other opportunities and we want to make sure that you have enough time to adequately update your resume. Uh, so the first Monday of every month we're doing resume walk-ins wide open so come on in and there will be a counselor available to see you on the first Monday of every month. So the very first time we're doing this is September 7th so feel free to come on in and uh, work with one of us. Obviously if Wednesdays don't work for you feel free to make an appointment through Trish and you can work with one of the counselors in the office to get that updated. So, um, so just try to do that as, as soon as you can so don't wait for a deadline. Uh, with respect to hiring timelines, so third year students, right now you're seeing emails coming out about judicial clerkship deadlines. So pay attention to your emails about that because those deadlines are typically over the summer that just passed as well as in the fall and early spring. We are doing an information session about judicial clerkships for Rhode Island specifically on September 21st. So if that's something you're interested in, please feel free to come to that. Two L's as well, thinking ahead. Uh, we'd love to have you there as well. Uh, the other employer, large employer that typically hires this early are federal government agencies. So a lot of those deadlines you're going to see, like the Department of Justice hires hundreds of law students, law graduates. Uh, that deadline is typically early September. So I want to make sure you're aware of those deadlines. Check the Arizona handbook. We send out email reminders every Friday about what deadlines are coming up. One important note with respect to federal applications is that that resume can be very different than your regular resume. This resume can be six to eight pages long if necessary. So if you are submitting an application to a federal agency, make sure you work with one of us in the office so you're, you're marketing yourself accordingly since that is definitely a different style of resume than what you're typically used to. With respect to second year students, so your hiring timeline is also somewhat extended. So right now, uh, we hope if you were interested in applying to large law firms, you've gotten a lot of those applications out already. We send out, sent out emails over the summer regarding that. Uh, there's still a little bit of a window if you're still interested in doing that. Uh, and then once that sort of flurry is done, you'll see there'll be deadlines throughout the year. You might have sent a bunch of applications out in August and you're still maybe applying in March or April, and that's okay. That's just sort of every employer hires on a different timeline, so don't feel like if you don't have a job by a certain date that you're unemployable. That's certainly not true, so just uh, know it's a marathon, not a sprint, and just keep working with us so we can keep telling you about opportunities. So just set your expectations accordingly. Mock interviews. So I just want to make sure everybody knows you can do a mock interview with our office. If you have an interview coming up and you haven't, you're not sure how to prepare, or if there's a conversation you need to have with a supervisor, whatever, we're happy to, to do a mock interview with you so that you are as prepared as possible. So a lot of students did that over the summer. I just want to make sure everybody knows that that's a possibility. Student groups. So we love hosting events with student groups. So if you are a student leader in this room, uh, please feel free to contact me if you have an event or an idea about an event that you want to work on together. I just had a meeting yesterday with April Criminal Law Society. We're working on a number of events. So please know that you can utilize our office in that way too so we can make connections uh, for you in the community. Uh, then two final things, Equal Justice Works is a career fair that's coming up in D.C. in October. Students get jobs every year at this career fair. If you are interested in government, nonprofit, NGOs, anywhere in the country or in the world, employers are going to be there uh, hiring students. So absolutely put that on your calendar. There's actually an information session today at 1 o'clock, but you can also check your email about that information. And if you are a stipend recipient, we thank you for all the work you did this summer. If you haven't yet turned in your final hours to us, please do so, as well as your evaluation. So we're looking forward to getting those as well. So that is it. Our office is open and can't wait to see you. So don't be shy. Come on by and visit. Thank you.
Hi, welcome back. Um, I think I know most of you. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Kathy Thompson. Um, I'm available for help with course selection. I'm one of the many people you can go to for that, or um, you can come for outlining help, just general um, getting away from the stress of it all in my office, okay? Most importantly today, I wanted to introduce you um, to two people. One that you already know, Professor John Ralston, who's going to talk to you about some things that you should be thinking about this year. And another person that you may not know yet, but I hope you get to know very well, Professor Justin Kishbaugh, who's our new writing specialist. Um, we're really fortunate to have him. I'm really excited that he's here to provide a writing support for you, and he's going to talk to you in a moment. He has um, a master's in fine arts in creative writing. He has a PhD in English literature. He has over 10 years' experience teaching students both academic writing and creative writing at the collegiate level and five years experience as a legal writing specialist at Duquesne Law School. Um, and he's just a really great guy too. So definitely use him as a resource and he's gonna come up and talk to you a little bit about what he's available for. And after he speaks, Professor Ralston's gonna talk to you about a few things to think about. Thanks. Hello, everyone. Justin Kishbaugh, great guy. <laughs> um, she kind of stole my whole intro here. But um, so I'm here to help you write um, pretty much at any stage in your writing process. There's essentially two things I wanted to let you know. Um, one, I'm here to help you at any stage in the writing process. But the earlier you involve me, the better. Um, of course, I'm here to help you polish up anything that you think is finished, but often I find students think that they need to have something written before they come see me, and that is certainly not the case. Um, the earlier I help you organize, streamline, we're all on the same page, the better. Um, frequently students will come right before their papers are due, and then they don't particularly like the feedback that I have for them because they want to turn it in. Um, so please do uh, come see me and make use of me. The other thing that I just wanted to let you know about is I also do not really offer a takeout service. So if you want to do some work with me, um, stop in, make an appointment, send me an email. Uh, it's J Kishbaugh, K-I-S-H-B as in boy, A-U-G-H at rwu.edu. And we can set up a time to work face to face. Um, it's easier for me if we can work together rather than trying to give you written feedback over the internet. Of course, if you're limited by distance, we can make accommodations for that. So again, I'm in uh, room 205. Um, I do hope to see you and meet you all on an individual level. Thank you. John Ralston, not such a great guy. Uh, <laughs> I try, though. Uh, okay. Thanks. Uh, all right, so four things. Uh, this is primarily for the three L's here. Um, first, the MPRE. For those of you who haven't taken the MPRE already, and that's the Multi-State Professional Responsibility Exam, most jurisdictions require that as a condition for you to get admitted to the bar. Uh, if you haven't taken that already, there's one coming up in November. It's November 5th, and the deadline to register for that is September 15th, so that's coming up. Um, for two L's, the uh, MPRE is something you're going to think about after you take professional responsibility. So this is something that's going to happen for you uh, maybe in the spring or, or next summer. Secondly, um, there have been a lot of changes uh, to the bar exam in the states uh, surrounding us. So Massachusetts, New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut. Um, primarily, the, the, the biggest change is that Connecticut, New Jersey, and New York have implemented what's known as the uniform bar exam. So they're no longer state-specific bar exams in those states. Um, they have this uniform test, which the benefit of which is that if you take that test in one of those states, you can seek admission in other states that have adopted the UB without taking a separate bar exam in those states. So that's a good thing. Um, but it changes a lot for our students. So um, for instance, you're not gonna be able to sit for uh, New York and New Jersey at the same time. That's not such a bad thing. You just have to sit for one of them, but that's something students have traditionally done at the law school. So that might change the way you're planning your, uh, your future and what bar exams you're gonna take. Also, Massachusetts has implemented this test as well, but that doesn't become effective until July of 2018. So that's not gonna affect you three L's, but it will affect 
all of you too well. So there have been a lot of changes, and so I've decided that uh, it might be best to have an info session about kind of what these changes are and how it's going to affect you, and that's going to come up in a few weeks. I'll send you an email about that info session. Uh, it would be an opportunity for you to come in, and I can present the specifics about each state and what the requirements are, and you can ask questions about your specific plans and how that's going to affect you, all right? So stay tuned for that email. Third, um, Bar review providers are going to start to come to campus soon. Those are the Barbary and, and Kaplan folks, and they're going to start, um, you know, uh, trying to sell you a course for uh, bar review. Um, that's something I think you should consider signing up for soon. Um, I've been told by them that they're going to offer pretty good deals here at the beginning of the year, and so this might be the best time for you to sign up if you want to get the best price you can uh, on a bar review course. Don't wait until the last minute. Uh, and lastly, uh, I'd like to meet with uh, all of you 3Ls uh, this semester um, to discuss your individual plans for the bar. So in addition to this info session we're going to have, I'd like to talk about you specifically and, and help you figure out a timeline for what you need to get together and how you can kind of uh, finish everything up here at school and, and, and run, uh, get a running start into your bar prep course next summer. So I'll be sending an email to those of you who are not in ALR. Those of you in ALR, we've already talked about this. But for those of you who are not, you'll get an email from me shortly, and, uh, and we'll find a time to meet for a few minutes during the semester to talk about your plans and make sure you're on track. Anybody have any questions? All right, great. Nice seeing you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Raquel Ortiz. I'm the assistant dean for the library, and I'm here to welcome back all 2Ls and 3Ls, and welcome to our transfer students. Um, I have a few updates from the library and I'm going to talk very briefly about our instructional programs. Um, one of the first updates, uh, which is a sad one, is that a number of our staff members have left for various reasons, retirements, promotions, etc. So uh, Phyllis O'Neill, Thelma Diziallo, and Kat Craig are no longer working in the library and we're working really fast to try to get new staff to join the library in the next few months. Um, secondly, uh, for those of you who are spending a lot of time in Providence, a librarian will be in residence in Providence on Tuesdays from 8.30 a.m. to 5 p.m. in the Feinstein Suite, room 460. So if you need an individual research consultation or you have research questions or reference questions, we'll be there every week on Tuesdays to answer your questions. Of course, that's not the only way to reach us. We have our Ask a Librarian service where you can reach us um, by phone, email, chat, et cetera, and of course, at the reference desk downstairs. In terms of our instructional programs, I wanted to uh, remind those of you who are in LP3 that um, you're going to have some refresher training with us. My understanding is that it is next week, and you will receive an email from Nicole. It will be during class, so you won't be required to come in for another separate section um, session for that. Um, just be sure to look for an email from Nicole Dyshlewski um, about your assigned date and time. Also, I wanted to mention again the Prepare for Practice program. This is the website where we have all of the information about the program, the requirements, et cetera. Um, I encourage you to come and visit the site, or if you want to learn more about it in person from us, we are going to be in the bistro again tomorrow from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. We have lemonade. Um, come drink some lemonade, talk to the librarians, and learn more about our Prepare for Practice program. Uh, for those of you who are in a summer placement or did ASD last year, Nicole sent out a very brief survey about your research experience. We ask you to please try to complete that. It's extremely short. I believe there's only like three or four questions. Um, it will help us also tweak our instructional programs and also uh, learn more where we need to send out more information um, on legal research. Finally, I want to remind you again about the Ask a Librarian service. We're here to help. It doesn't matter if you're a 2L, it doesn't matter if you're a 3L, it doesn't matter if you're in the last semester of law school. There is no shame in asking questions of the reference librarians. We want to make sure that you know what you're doing and that you're not spinning your wheels trying to do your work. Thank you. Hi, welcome back everybody. Um, I'm Kate Politano. If I know most of you, if some of you haven't met me, I'm the Assistant Director of Financial Aid. I just have about five updates for you guys. Um, 
I guess the most important thing right now is refunds. So if you've received your refund and it's not what you expected, if you have any questions or concerns, please come see us. Um, if you were expecting a refund, you thought you should have had it by now and you haven't, also please come and see us. We're more than happy to take a look and make sure everything is the way it should be. Um, health insurance. Some of you um, were charged health insurance and some of you needed to purchase the school's health insurance. So that did, um, that was an added cost and that wasn't factored in to your budget. So if, in fact, you think you need a little bit extra funds to cover that cost, then you can um, you know, be more than happy to look at your budget and increase that to cover that cost as well. Um, and for three L's, uh, with the bar application coming up, just wanted to let you know what we can do to help um, in terms of funding. Um, in financial aid, you can, uh, we can help you adjust your budget and increase it for the application fees. So financial aid can cover up to two states bar exams. Um, however, we can't um, increase your financial aid to cover the, um, the Barbary or, or, or the prep course. So unfortunately we can't help with that, but we can help with the um, application fees. And um, <clears throat> if any of you are, interested in bar loans. Um, there are pretty much the, the three top companies right now offering them are Sally Mae, I think Wells Fargo, and Discover. So uh, RISLA, Rhode Island Student Loan Authority, used to um, offer bar loans and they stopped as of last year, so they're no longer doing bar loans. Um, in terms of online resources, if you want information on scholarship opportunities, we regularly update the Simplicity site so you can look at um, scholarship opportunities if you're looking to offset um, and help pay for your bill. Um, and just any information on um, financial literacy, budgeting, um, you know, reducing your borrowing, things like that, please come to our office, please talk to us. We have resources that we can um, point you in the right direction toward. And then the last thing, in terms of just general financial aid, um, I'm sure most of you who wanted to um, take out federal loans have done your FAFSA. Uh, for those of you who have not, um, kind of were on the fence if you wanted to take federal loans, there's still time. You have time during the semester to still apply, uh, fill out your FAFSA, and um, have us look at your eligibility for federal loans. And uh, for those of you who might have recently submitted your FAFSA, we are still packaging and sending out award letters, and you will be receiving those via email. Any questions? Feel free to stop by our office and, and ask any questions you have. Thank you. Thank you. I'm last. Everyone has left me except for Dean Horowitz. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> So welcome back. I'm excited for another school year. Um, and just a few important reminders, um, just administrative announcements is gonna be our primary way that we try to communicate upcoming events um, and other important information to students. So individual offices will communicate outside of that, but um, please make sure that you're reading that carefully so you're kind of in the know about important information sessions that were um, highlighted today. Um, so today I have to cover want to cover and have to cover um, an important topic. I know everyone received an email from me um, earlier this week regarding um, Haven Plus training, and I'll get to that in a little bit more detail later. Um, but one topic that I want to go over again um, with all the students here is our sexual misconduct and gender-based misconduct policy. And this is training that I will be providing in my capacity as um, Title IX Deputy Coordinator for the School of Law annually, so both to first-year students and returning students. I do want to introduce Jen Stanley, who was newly promoted to the Title IX coordinator for the university, and she's really excellent. She, many law students, particularly members of the Women's Law Society and Family Law Society, interact with her in her capacity overseeing the Women's Center. Um, and she really helps to make sure that we have a positive culture on the campus regarding sexual assault. Um, I did hear some feedback from my 
email and it's like, why are we talking about this topic? And we're talking about it, one, because it really impacts students, um, particularly um, victims and accused um, who are involved with sexual misconduct. And it does happen at the law school level. And so we've had students, at, um, law students who have been um, suspended for a semester. We've had victims of sexual assault. And this is a really serious matter that requires our, our full attention. So I just want to go through a few slides briefly. Um, so first of all, I want to talk about what is sexual misconduct. And it's really broad. And so, of course, we're talking about really high level things, such as rape and what you traditionally think about sexual assault. But it also um, encompasses relationship violence, sexual exploitation, um, stalking, um, and an attempt of any of these actions. So the policy is actually published on our website, and it's incorporated by reference in the student handbook. There's a really helpful um, handout that's on the table. Please pick it up when you leave that we also make available in the library and other places around the building. Um, and so, of course, sexual misconduct and gender-based misconduct is expressly prohibited by both the university code as well as the student handbook. Um, and so any member of the law school or university has been a victim or witnessed um, misconduct um, should refer the, to this handbook that's referenced. All the information is online. Again, you can refer to either of the student handbooks. When we think about how, how do we get into this area, why do cases come forward, one of the biggest things has to do with effective consent. And so as law students, you've been through torts, you've been through criminal law. Um, Consent requires clear, knowing, and voluntary consent prior to and during a sexual activity. Um, sexual permission, I mean, these are things that I think logically that law students can, can reason and figure it out. But in practice, things get muddy. Um, and I wanna be really explicit and really clear that where cases happen, almost all of them involve drugs and alcohol majority of them. And so this is where people, I say, make mistakes or get into, this is where cases under Title IX, sexual misconduct, are generated. It's very clear you cannot give effective consent if someone is intoxicated, if they can't appreciate the who, what, where, when, and why of a sexual interaction. And it cannot be given under conditions of threats of physical harm, intimidation, coercion, or incapacit incapacitation due to alcohol or drugs. And so where someone is intoxicated or compromised, it's best to refrain um, from, from sexual um, relationships. No always means no. Yes always means yes. Um, so I'll keep going. So this is a university policy. And really, this is these are things that's really interesting, and it's an interesting position for me to be talking to like third, second and third year law students about like your sexual lives and your sexual relationships. And I promise you, I'd much rather be having this. I'd rather be having this discussion now in 283 rather than in my office because you've been a victim of relationship violence or sexual misconduct. And so. When you're engaging in um, sexual activity, it's best to verbally communicate intentions and consent, whether it's yes, whether it's no. Um, and again, going back, no always means no, and yes may not always mean yes. Um, co coercion's not consent, let's see. Bystanders play a really important role um, by speaking up and intervening, and this is one exciting opportunities. So when you think about how can law students interact with Title IX or sexual misconduct policies on campus, is that it's actually an emerging area of practice. Um, there's a lot of a lot of media stories on a weekly basis about what's going on nationally. And so I'm hoping to engage more students to um, take advantage of the training opportunities across campus and to think about this as an opportunity for legal practice. So Dean Horwitz is still here, like the AG's office has a really active practice area. And so if you um, are interested in criminal law, if you're interested in family law, even women's law issues, um, th this is a great area to think more about how to be involved. And so the It's On Us campaign is a national campaign that the university participates in. And it has to do with bystander intervention. So the ability to kind of survey what's going on and intervene. And so. Um, it's an excellent training, and these are kind of 
I don't know if there's certifications you put on your resume, but if you are interested in working in this area, I encourage you to take advantage of these training opportunities. So the It's On Us campaign is a national campaign coming out of the um, presidential office, the US President Obama, at least for a few more months. Um, and you recognize, identify, intervene, and create. Most important, its effort is to create an environment where sexual assault is unacceptable and where survivors are supported. Um, so just if someone is accused or found responsible for sexual misconduct, it results in a suspension for not less than one semester, um, all the way to expulsion from RWU law. So it's just important to know that this is um, of highest significance. Um, and for the law school, there's a permanent notation on your RWU law transcript. So judicially, our honor code does not cover um, matters under Title IX, so they're actually adjudicated under the university process for serious matters. Um, it's just important to know that it's the policy, you can find this online, um, the practice and how the judicial process works, but we would walk you through that. Um, but it balances the needs of the student and the community, values or fairness, honesty and integrity, and, usually, and the purpose is, of course, education, restoration and protection. Okay. So, what to do if you need to report sexual misconduct. Um, the first and most important thing is to get to a safe place, um, if necessary, to receive medical attention and emotional support, um, and then to report that misconduct. And so you are always in the driver's seat um, and reporting misconduct that can be reporting it to the institution, to the law school, myself is my capacity as deputy Title IX coordinator or any Title IX coordinator that's listed on the handout or online, um, including public safety. Um, but RWU students are encouraged to speak to university staff as well as local police and get support um, and make a formal reports of sexual misconduct. I think it's also important to know that um, we will have victims of sexual misconduct or relationship violence that um, are members of our community, but perhaps the other actor is not. Um, you can still come and speak to any Title IX coordinator, and we encourage you to do that so we can provide appropriate support. Um, support can varies individually, student by student, but there, there are a lot of tools that we have in our toolbox to make sure you can still participate fully as a member of the institution. So who do you report to? So you can report to me, you can of course report to Jen Stanley. There's a list of deputy Title IX coordinators, so there's one for undergraduate students, one for employees, um, so anyone on that list. Um, there's also the judicial offices. You don't have to say, wait, who am I supposed to talk to? It's not the honor board. Of course, you can speak to the honor board and they'll refer that matter appropriately. And also you can make a primary report directly with the undergrad student conduct and community standards office. Law enforcement options, Providence, Bristol, police or whatever town you may live in. Um, and also our public safety office. And Pam Moffitt is a really excellent trained investigator and a great source um, of support to students and to take primary information. And there are other officers there as well. Um, there are confidential resources on campus, and this is really important to know. These are the only confidential resources on campus. That's the Counseling Center. Um, Reverend Nancy Sukup, who's the multi-faith chaplain for the university. And then we have a relationship with Day One, which is a community-based organization. Um, outside of those confidential resources, if you disclose um, an incident to a member of the law school administration or faculty, they are under obligation as responsible employees to notify either myself or Jen in our capacities as Title IX coordinator. And that doesn't mean you end up on this train where you have to like file a report with the police, but we have a duty um, to provide a safe and supportive environment to victims of sexual um, misconduct. And so we take that responsibility really seriously. So even though I spoke to you all today, um, I still am requiring all students to participate um, to complete Haven Plus training. So everyone got an email from me, and that's for all law students, first year, second year, third year. This is a one-time training. Um, so next year, it will only be the first year students will be required to do this. Um, but because we've had cases and incidents, I think it's really important that we all have shared language, shared norms, and are really um, coming together to create an environment that is free of sexual assault and misconduct. So check your email. If you don't complete the training, I will email you again. Um, we're asking everyone to complete it by September 2nd. So 
this just gives you, it takes about 30 to 45 minutes. And I do recognize that that's a significant amount of time. Um, and I think it's an important investment that each of us um, need to make. I think it's our responsibility as members of a university campus and a law school, as well as just um, community members to be more aware of this issue. Um, I've taken the training myself several times. It is specifically tailored to graduate and professional students. So you're not taking the same training that you took as an undergrad if you completed training and you're not taking the same training as our undergraduate students here. So recognizing that the situations might be different. So if you do that by September 2nd. And does anyone have any questions? You are free to go. Thank you.